Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 61. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is John Zilch, creator of Clever Kids Mysteries series of games. Thanks for coming on the podcast, John. Thanks for having me, Mark. Excited to be here. Fantastic. Uh, We're going to be talking about... John's experience with board games, his experience creating this series of puzzle games for kids, and then we're going to talk a little bit about family games, because he mentioned that when uh, we're discussing what to what to cover on the podcast, and I realized I never actually talked about that before on the Thoughtful Gamer podcast, and it's kind of a, a, a large hole, I guess, in our coverage so far, so I think that'll be an interesting conversation. So cool. let's begin with, I guess, what got you into board games? Or what was the impetus for creating uh, the Clever Kids Mysteries? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I guess I'll start off by saying that I'm a rookie uh, game designer, uh, or at least I was when I started um, Clever Kids Mysteries. And I uh, didn't really have any plans to create board games. We were always a board game family. Um, and uh, it, was, it was kind of a funny uh, you know, impetus to this whole thing. We were, actually, we were at a friend's house, and they have young kids, and I have um, seven-year-old twin girls. And they were, they were playing and running around. And uh, it, you know, they, they ran over to the adults, and they, they had some kind of notebook or something from the, our friend's kitchen and said, who wrote this post-it note? And they started kind of, you know, playfully accusing folks of who wrote it. And, you know, we didn't really know what was going on. And we started playing along with it. And they were creating this mystery and checking it for fingerprints and, and uh, you know, inter- interviewing, um, interrogating, I guess, each of the, uh, the different suspects, quote unquote, in their mind. And, you know, we were laughing along with it. But I th- you're kind of watching them. And they did this for about 45 minutes to an hour or so. I thought, wow, kids really liked solving things. They really like these, these mysteries, even when they have to fabricate the story um, from virtually nothing and, and create these narratives. I, I said to myself, I wish there was something where, you know, we could create a better experience around that. How do we actually build a, a mystery uh, for them to solve with real clues and everything else that, that does a good job of it and helps them learn and, and challenges them a bit? So that experience was totally out of the blue. And, and you know, it's done a couple different – we've taken – different turns along the way as to what the game could be. But that was our, that, that was really the inspiration for, for creating this series. That's really interesting. Right? Yeah. Cause there's often this demarcation between structured games and then kind of kids free form play. But I love that the free form play was the inspiration for creating the game. So, t- so I guess Tell me how the Clever Kids games work. What's kind of the structure of it? Yeah, and those. Um, I guess the answer to that would I'd, I'd talk a little bit about the twists and turns or the pivots that we've made in our in our design process. Because at one point it was, and you can find these online, you know, like a print and play type thing where you set up some of the, the clues in the game, and the kids just kind of take it all, take it from there um, and run through it on their own. Um, but what we found was. To make it really challenging, to make it interesting, and also to create a better uh, family bonding experience, maybe we don't build these games for kids, right? Like I'm, I'm thinking of some of the board games that are out there, the classic ones like a mouse trap or something where you know a toddler and above could could probably play it on their own as a group. How do we get a whole family involved in playing the game? So that that was part of you know how we wanted to design it, and really the way it works is rather than having like a technical case to solve where you're just trying to find um, a suspect and and uh, you know get to that answer, sort of like uh, I guess Clue would be the classic example of of that. We didn't want to make it. Um, so regimented in that sense. We really wanted to create a narrative of a story, almost an experience. And one of our inspirations is uh, escape rooms um, and and escape rooms that you can bring home and and play at your house. This isn't necessarily an escape room, but it's the same type of thing where there is a narrative, there is a story, you're trying to accomplish something, you have a role, you know, the player has a role in this story and we provide the clues. And from there, um, You know, you have to kind of work through, we have each game that we've made so far has eight different puzzles that require a different level of thinking. And 
once you get through that puzzle, you know, you, you put it all together to, to, to ultimately solve the mystery. So there's a lot of, it's paper-based. There's a lot of, you know, it's a physical game where you get a lot of the clues and assets and there's hands-on things you have to do with those clues in order to, uh, to accomplish the, the goal. When you say the players have a role, do you mean the players as a whole have a role in the narrative or are there actually assigned roles for each of the participants individually? It's more the former. So it's it's a loose role in that, well, there's this um, Clever Kids detective agency, you know, that are fictional characters that we provide in a case file. And really the ask there is we need your help, the players, uh, uh, to help us to help us uh, kind of close out this mystery, so to speak. Gotcha. And essentially do all the work. <laughs> right, right, right. Precisely. Yeah. And so are, are there specific puzzle types you lean towards when – when creating these games, or do you try to be diverse with it? Diverse. That's exactly it. Uh, and, you know, it's not always easy uh, to, sure. to come up with them all, but process of elimination, um, really anything across the critical thinking spectrum. So what would be some examples, if you, if you don't mind? No, or rather, not at all. If you can do that without spoiling it for potential people playing the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they come in all, all forms. Um I'd say another inspiration, and I know I'm crossing genres here away from board games, so I apologize. But uh, when I was a kid, and I'm dating myself a little bit, uh, there was a popular video game uh, series called King's Quest that, that I remember was the first game we had installed in our computer. A friend brought it over. Mm-hmm. And that was – you know, it was a puzzle game um, that was very uh, inventory. I don't know what there's a name for it, but inventory based. And you, you, you know, collect these assets and then you have to use them in places. And it would drive me up the wall trying to figure these things out. This is pre-internet. Again, I'm dating myself. But you'd actually have to go and figure it out. Unless you had a friend who's solved the game, you know, there's there's a, a certain level of patience that's required. So that's one example of, and that's probably the simplest example of a puzzle that we have. Um, We try to start off the game with some of the simpler ones, such as, uh, you know, here's a a dental diagram of, you know, a dinosaur's teeth, right? And all the different teeth. And somewhere in the museum, if you look through pictures, you'll see a a giant dinosaur set up, obviously a pretend dinosaur, um, a model of a dinosaur. And if you look closely enough, you'll find that one of the teeth is missing. If you match that up to the dental diagram that's somewhere else in the, you know, in a, a guidebook, um, well, that will give you an answer. In this case, it's a letter that you'll use as one of the puzzles. So that's a really, really simple one to give you an example of something that's more clue-based. So you've got to connect dots to be able to find that out. I think more on the a uh, more difficult side would be in our most recent game, which is Christmas themed. You know, there's there's nine pens in a stable, and you have to figure out which reindeer goes in each one. Or I'm sorry, you have to ultimately figure out which one Rudolph goes into. But you have to move those reindeers around based on different rules and logic that we give you. Certain reindeer can't be next to each other. Certain one have to be in the middle. And frankly, a lot of the adults that you know, the parents or or teachers or grandparents or or what have you. Um, aunts, uncles who, who purchase the game say that they have a lot of fun with it too because it's not necessarily easy for an adult either. So that that's one of the challenges that we're up against is finding a puzzle that's fun for kids but not too challenging and then finding a puzzle that's fun for the adults to help with that's not too easy uh, and, and somewhat engaging on both sides. Yeah, I, I was actually going to ask about that because I was, I was reading through your your website and there's this kind of repeated focus on you want the parents and children to work on the game together. What's the process for finding a puzzle or, or a hook that will appeal to both age sets? Yeah, that, that's really tough. And we throw away a lot of puzzles uh, because of that. And um, I mean, I think the obvious answer is just testing them. And, and seeing which ones actually stick for both for both uh, you know uh, types of, of user or player and then you know I, I guess just trying to find that middle ground of something that's that's you know in that sweet spot in the middle but I think what also helps is if you put some of the easier ones in at the beginning of the game you know just as people kind of read through the story and read through the the narrative they're going to try to tackle some of the puzzles that just we ask of earlier on. We try to design it in a way that the the adults that are playing 
um, are comfortable knowing that they're going to have to kind of ease off the break or, you know, let, let the player figure it out on their own and maybe help them a bit, but not too much. And then as the complexity increases, you know, that that adult player will get more and more involved and offer help. But it's kind of a way of just setting that pace early on. But to answer your question, you know, in terms of designing it, it's really, really tricky. I'd say on the adult side, it's more of my gut feeling in designing the game. Like, would I find this to be easy enough or hard enough where it's fun? But for the kids, honestly, it's really, really tough for us to know without playtesting. And do you have do you have a good number of playtesters you can send these out to? You know, we, we could do better. <laughs> <I think. laughs> That's I'm, always the challenge. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, hopefully I'm not the first person to say this on your podcast. Um, oh, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, you know, I don't even want to look up the statistics around how many we should have. And um, we've got a small group, you know, and, and there's some friends and family in there. And then, uh, of course, my own kids, which is helpful, too, because they're, they're, you know, easily accessible. You can just run the puzzle upstairs, say, hey, give this a shot, and they'll give you instant feedback. Um, but again, that's just a focus group of, of two in this case. So yeah, we're, we're probably in the single digits still, but uh, hopefully as we grow, we'll, we'll expand that. And then in terms of the narrative, because you've mentioned that a, a few times, is that a strong component in the game? Uh, because like I, I've played, I've been playing a few of these the style of game, the like escape room in the box games, and and I've seen that run the gamut from really trying to push a narrative to just the sheerest veneer of story, and then it's just like <laughs> here's some puzzles. What's the significance of narrative in, in your games? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and I, I I'm laughing because I've experienced this. I've gone to the the actual escape rooms only a couple times, but sometimes they try to tell you a story where it's like you might as well not even have told us like we know we're just trying to get through this thing like let's just call it what it is you know there's no mad scientist that went missing or something like that with a paper-based game or a physical game like we have it's really tough to you know hide things obviously or have something that gets uncovered as you go i think there are other companies that do that and there are you know folks in our uh category who do things by mail so you know if you solve this puzzle you, I don't know if you go to a site or something and then you advance and then you'll get another package or some, something along those lines. We didn't want to go that direction in our design. We wanted to, you get this game, you can solve it in one shot. You know, it's all packaged up here for you. But with that comes a challenge because we need to create a narrative in which, you know, you're solving these puzzles, but at the end of the day, they all come together uh, to mean something and to help you solve the mystery. So it's 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 actually um, probably the hardest thing that we have to do is create create that narrative where eight of the puzzles end up being clues to solve a bigger mystery. Um, you know, in our first one, it's you get eight letters and you scramble those letters at the end to figure out where something's hidden, right? So that's that's basically the narrative. And and to be completely candid with you, Mark, I think we're probably more on that. I think you said the light veneer side in that, hey, you know, this in our first game, this museum's a little bit, something's going on, this place is shady, uh, you know, go explore their characters a little bit, the characters of the game, you know, the fictional ones that we've added and some of the history, but essentially you're, it's known right at the beginning, you're trying to find something that's hidden here and you have to solve these eight puzzles to find it. That's one thing I'm hoping we can get better at, and really I can get better at, mm -hmm. um, as the designer, is creating something where pieces of the narrative are uncovered as you go. You know, but how to how to expose that? You know, when all of the pieces are are delivered in that first package is is a challenge. Do you do you see in your playtesting or your feedback that people are getting into the story, even though, you, like you said, you you could work to improve on it? Because I, I always find it interesting that in all kinds of games. It's, it's sometimes surprising to me where people get attached to the story or the setting. And sometimes it's where you would expect it with, with a highly thematic game or something like that. But sometimes just there's something that I can't perceive that gets people into a setting where they they feel connected to that story. What's the feedback you've gotten on your games in, in that sense? Well, the best feedback that we've received, I guess this isn't really answering your question, but it's the part that made us feel I mean, because we're, you know, we've only got a few dozen sales. We're a really young company, but, sure. um, you know, we get, we get a lot of feedback from people saying, yes, you know, I played this with my niece. I played this with, you know, my nephew and, um, my son, my daughter, whatever. 
And they weren't very comfortable reading, but they almost forgot that they were practicing their reading when they were doing this. And they were just going through and they couldn't wait and they were reading it out loud. And they um, – much going back to the origin of why we started this, I, I think kids like to – you know, they like to take some kind of control because their whole lives are being told not to do things and to do things and to clean your room and all this. So. To give them that empowerment that you're solving this mystery, you're into the story, um, this is your thing to solve. Like, you know, we get pictures back from our customers with the kids is kind of like kneeling on the chair, like, you know, kind of leaning forward, reading this <laughs> this document or whatever it is, the case file that we send. And it's like you could tell they're engaged and in, into it, and it doesn't feel like reading. It doesn't feel like doing work. You know, there's a little bit of math that we'll have in our games. They don't feel like they're doing math. So... I think any time we can get them engaged in the in the narrative is really good, and we get that feedback. Um, and part of what I think makes designing games fun in general, but also in this particular case, is you just learn things that you didn't expect. So there's three fictional detective kid, you know, detectives that kind of lay out the case for the player and say, "Hey, we need your help. Our names are, you know, Leia, uh, Susie, and Nick." And my kids come back and they say well, wait, which one's Leia? Which one's Susie? Which one, you know, what grade are they in? They, they really want to connect with these these characters. And for me, I'm all about, oh, they're just giving you the case. Don't worry about them. Move on to the actual puzzles. So again, you know, kind of a opportunity for us to grow and to get better is to have more of a connection to the fi- uh, the fictional characters that are, that are part of the story, which I find, you know, kids take more of a liking to or, or want to know more about. And then, and then, you know, they'll also... They'll also call out, oh, it was really fun working, you know, you know, trying to find the golden owl and here it is. And they, they're posing with the picture of it or the dinosaur one was really fun because my, my kid loves dinosaurs um, and those types of things, too. And, and that's one thing that we pay a lot of attention to is, you know, we're not going to probably have a mystery that's in an office park because, you know, kids tend to like those things that kids like dinosaurs. Um, unicorns, you know, kings and queens, princesses. So we try to incorporate elements, of, um, any, really anything, you know, Santa Claus related or reindeers, animals. So we're trying to incorporate those things that kids can can relate to and get engaged with. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and I have a question for you, I guess, in the games sure. that you've played in those escape room games, um, you know, you said there was a light veneer in some of them. But what about the others? I mean, have you seen cases where it's worked? Maybe even in board games, right? Where there's Oh, this is more fun because of the backstory and and you know some of the characters that are involved, not so much the gameplay and the technical details. For me, it's I I tend towards games that are well, I lean toward liking heavier games. So I, I do appreciate mechanisms a lot. And 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 if you you know if you read my reviews, it's very much focused on how well the mechanisms work. But yep. I realized a while ago that when I looked at like my very, very favorite games, they're almost universally very deeply thematic and story driven, but it's it's more the the mechanisms connecting to the theme of the game very on a very deep level. So like, you know, a game like Space Alert, a cooperative game where you're in a yep. spaceship warding off in real time, you know, alien attacks and such. And it really makes you feel like you're panicked in, in, in working together as, as a team in a desperate situation. Um, for the, huh. for the puzzle games though, I'm finding that, and I don't have a ton of experience. I've played a couple of the escape games. Yep. Um, I think three so far, I've got two more. I need to, I need to go through or start of oh, the exit games. And I just finished playing one called, there's, there's two in a series, Dr. Esker's Notebook and Son of Do- Dr. Esker's Notebook. And those two, like, there's there's barely anything there. It's basically just dropping 10 puzzles on you. And it's like, here, solve these puzzles. But I, I found that the puzzle quality is really important to me because I like, I like the Esker's Notebook once quite a bit. Um, the Exit once try to do a narrative, but I haven't seen it yet. And again, they've got like 15 out or something, and I've played three so far. Right. But I haven't yet found the narrative to be particularly compelling, which is which is why I find it so interesting that you're kind of focusing on giving a narrative, and maybe it's just you know I've kind of lost that childlike wonder where I'm more you know grouchy and critical about it. 
But so far, the most interesting narrative things with the exit games is actually when they do the meta puzzles where they incorporate some part of the game that you wouldn't expect to be part of the game into it without huh. spoiling things. But when it's when it's pulling, it, it's twisting your brain where, in terms of what counts as materials for the game or what's an angle to those materials that you haven't seen before. Those have been really interesting, but I haven't yet been caught into the narrative of an escape room board, you know, physical game. Right. Yeah, I could see that too, and it's really interesting. That's a, that's an interesting point you made. How the mechanics and the and the theme have to kind of work together because if you've got <laughs> space invaders or space aliens attacking you, and then the mechanics allow for that type of urgency, right? Those those two seem to fit, right, hand in glove. Right. Yeah, and and it's interesting in, in an escape room type game or a puzzle game, I guess I would call it. I don't know what the strategy there is. I, I mean, I, I haven't played your games, but the, but the idea of like, okay, we're a detective agency, we're trying to solve something, um, seems pretty natural. The idea, and I, and I joked about this in one of my reviews, like with the exit games, you know, it's like, oh, it's an escape room in a box, but I'm like, well, you're not escaping a room, <laughs> right? <laughs> like none of it fits. Like, yeah, yeah. There's no room to escape from, and there's no escaping. You're just going through some puzzles. And maybe they try to incorporate within, like, the story some kind of idea of escape, but it doesn't really fit. Have you played uh, the Sherlock Holmes games? The Sherlock I, Holmes uh, consulting detective games? We, I actually haven't. I had, in, in fact, you know, I've done a fair amount of research. I hadn't heard of those. So that's interesting. Same yeah. Same idea? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's certainly... It's not aimed at family. Like, like it's, it's. Yeah. I mean, kids would enjoy it, but it's they're really, really difficult. Yeah. Um And and uh, it's purely, it, it's almost purely text based, but it's it's kind of the same thing. The idea is that like you're 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 a group of detectives who are aiding Sherlock Holmes, and then he gives you a case, and then at the end he's like, "Wow, you guys took forever to solve that." It, part of the thing is that Sherlock Holmes is super obnoxious at the end of the game. He's like, "I figured it out in three steps, and you took twelve. Um, yeah we don't want to do that to kids uh but 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 i think the idea of like a detective agency or like here's a case you've been assigned seems like a better narrative fit than this like you're stuck in a room but you're not actually stuck in a room and you've got to escape but you're not actually escaping anything yeah i mean i i'm 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 agreeing with you um I don't know how interesting that'll make <laughs> for, your, for your conversation on the podcast here, but I, I agree because I've only done two or three escape room, physical, you know, escape rooms mm-hmm. where you go to the place, but part of the, and I love it. I mean, I, I, I wish oh, I could yeah, do more. Are. Some of them are great. But I like the set, des- or I guess, I don't know if set design is the right term, but you walk in there and it's like, oh, this is cool. Like, I'm going to go explore it a little bit. And then eventually, like, things move and you go into another room. And um, the physicality of it is what I really, really appreciate from those. I think I haven't been to too many escape rooms where the puzzles themselves couldn't have come in a box. You know, sometimes they're like physical puzzles, like a almost like a jigsaw type thing or putting together maps. I mean, whatever it's been, uh, there hasn't been too much where we couldn't recreate that out of a box but to your point yeah to get that in a box and be and say now you've got to escape the room and there's really no time limit and yeah that that's and you're not really walking around anywhere we have gotten that feedback though we have um received feedback that and it's usually from been from adults not from kids because i don't think kids do escape rooms but hey why not make this into some kind of escape room or some kind of experience where you hide the clues around a room? And frankly, uh, you know, we're still thinking of that. We're still considering that where um, instead of getting them in a box and just kind of pouring through the box, you know, maybe they are set up in a room and you have to go and uh, kind of find the clues and then work through them. Uh, the other feedback we've gotten in, in a few of our sales um, more recent, so we haven't really gotten feedback post playing the game, but we've had teachers who have purchased the product and, and they want to, you know, uh, deploy these for their classroom. Um, so that could be another place where maybe if you had stations and people could go, you know, different teams of students could go around and solve the puzzles. Uh, that could be interesting too. But yeah, uh, so far we're, we're kind of clinging to the, this is a case. There are puzzles inside this, this box, sit at a kitchen table Make yourself some hot chocolate. You know, a few few of our customers have had dinner during um, mm-hmm. and, and played the game throughout dinner, which to me seems like a great way to to go about it. That's been the experience thus far. Yeah, yeah, and and 
I mean, I, I think that's the pace at which the puzzle games work best. Because, like, the exit games, they, they there's an app and everything, and, and they time you. And you get, you're, you're ostensibly racing against the clock, and you get points based on how quickly you get it done. But this, uh, the one I played recently, Esker, doesn't really have anything like that. Like, it, it there's no point system. It's just, like, here's some puzzles. So I just, the most recent one, I just played by myself across a few evenings and then i'd you know when i was done with stuff for the day i'd go into the living room pull it out and it's like okay let's try to get a couple of these done and then if i got too angry at myself i'd just go to bed and think about it and revisit it the next night but like the, i don't know when you have the product there in front of you and it doesn't have the urgency of like going to a place and again trying to escape a room i think yeah, you could set that up, and it you know certainly would be an interesting experiment to include rules and instructions, maybe for you know whatever adult is facilitating the game for the kids to actually go hide things around the room. But the casual kind of let's just try to work through the puzzle and solve it at our own pace, I think works nicely also, even if it comes at the expense of some level of narrative. Yeah. Um, another thing I'd throw in there, uh, somewhat related, is um, what I call the yellow submarine theory in, in, uh, in how we design games and that we've received feedback also from one pain customer than my brother's one of my play testers. He's got young kids, but he also, he runs through the game first and you know, he'll text me back and say, Hey, it only took me 20 minutes or it only took me 45 minutes. And I said, well, yeah, this is, this is really built for kids to be played with adults, you know, but he's like, but then, you know, my, my brother-in-law and, and, or, um, yeah, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law came over who don't have kids they saw the game sitting on the table and they played it and they had a lot of fun with it. it. Took them about 45 minutes, which you know at our $10 price point, 45 minutes isn't isn't terrible. And and why I say it's the Yellow Submarine, I, I came across something where Yellow Submarine by the Beatles was a song that was written for children. And you know, I think it's pretty much beloved throughout pretty much all you know, all humans now um mm-hmm. you hear it it's kind of a nice you know jovial song and, and people in, enjoy the the tune um so I, we kind of look at the the game design and the puzzle design the same way like it, sh- it it could be played by adults and enjoyed if they're okay with a kid's narrative right there's no this isn't you know a, a disease that's spreading you know uh what is it, pandemic or whatever the, the game is there where mm-hmm. it's cooperative and it's a very heavy uh, subject matter. I mean, this is going to be a kid's game, but again, a yellow submarine, and if you listen to those lyrics, those are very kid-like too, but I don't think any of us really want to turn that song off when we hear it because it's too childish. Um, so, you know, we don't market this as if you don't have kids or you don't have a teacher, or you're not, you know, running a, a Girl Scout, Boy Scout troop, um, you should buy the game. We still want to make it where the adults playing this game with their kids are going to enjoy it. To your point, I think the challenge we have is how can we make a game where people might might need to come back to it the next night or the night after that? I guess what we're trying to really force through, and it's not easy, and I'm not sure it's the right decision, is we're also trying to teach patience. We're trying to teach patience to a group of players, kids, who you know, really don't want to learn patience and probably aren't built for um, patience at, at, uh, at age six to 12. You know, I, I think it's a very valuable thing to learn and to practice as, as a human, you know, and I struggle with it now. But that patience part is also tricky because I think today, especially in today's world, you just expect immediate gratification. And I'm going to play this game and there's going to be a resolution by the time I'm done. What we're, I guess, still testing is could you go put it on a you know, a table over in the corner or maybe on the side of your kitchen table and uh, your counter. And could it be sitting there for a couple days? Um, you could do it an hour, an hour and a half easily, um, but maybe you don't want to. Maybe you want to make it last for a, a couple days, a few days um, and work through it. So I think that's also an, an interesting element of how we're how we're looking at this and hoping that it, it works out in that sense. Yeah, then that, that, that leads me to my next question, which is specifically about family gaming. In terms of, of gaming with your kids, um, I mean, before Clever Kids Mystery, if you could tell me about, you know, what, what your experiences have been, and then generally, what what are the types of games and experiences that you found work best when, when playing with your kids? Yeah, sure. I think 
appropriate to what we've spoken about already. I'm turning around here to to get the name of it. I, I think it's a pretty popular kids or family, I should say, cooperative game called Race to the Treasure. It's very simple. You you know you pick cards and and kind of move these move around until you can collect enough treasure and then get home or something before you know you turn over. Um, too many, I forget what it is, ogres or something like that. Mm-hmm. And my kids love that game. One, it's very simple, um, simple to learn, right? So there's not a whole lot of, you have to sit here for seven to eight minutes while dad reads the instructions, which is just kind of like panic inducing because I can see them kind of, you know, just just shaking and ready to play. And I'm, I'm sitting there trying to read all these complex instructions to a game. So I think anytime you can find a game like Race to the Treasure or something where uh, it's just very simple for kids to grasp right off the bat and, uh, and, and start getting value out of, that's, that's really helpful. But it also, going back to that narrative thing, there's, you know, you want to get the treasure, that's kind of obvious. And you, you kind of grow this distaste toward the ogre uh, to the point where the kids will start kind of like, pumping their, you know, shaking their fists like, oh, that ogre came again. And they, they can kind of feel a little bit of that, uh, that dread. Uh, and there's a bad guy or a antagonist for the game. So those, those have worked really well with, with our kids. And also, I just think, you know, they're at a, being seven and a half now, they're at this weird age where they're, for a lot of different types of media, but board games in particular, they're almost on the cusp of turning over into games that adults might play, right? So we'd play Monopoly with them and they don't understand all the rules like mortgage and all this stuff but it's hard when you've got one team or one player who's just you know collecting all the property and drowning out the other kid from (laughs) from their Mm -hmm. money and making it rain you know it's uh it's an uncomfortable experience and one kid's just not having it and eventually he'll probably end up quitting and running away and, and maybe never wanting to play again so i think it's it's trying to find the right game that you know isn't too harsh when it comes to the mechanics of it uh, and, and gives you a fighting chance. And I, and I totally understand, you know, in the board game community, Monopoly is not one of the highest ranked when it comes to mechanics and, and gamesmanship and sure. game design. But so that's a bad example. But yeah, we try to find games that, you know, I think have that narrative, um, are simple to play. Uh, and, and I think cooperative also just is a good is a good lesson for kids. Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask about cooperative gaming because your games are cooperative. Was the one you mentioned before the uh, Escape from the Ogre one, is that yeah. also a cooperative game? It is, yep. Yeah, uh, do, you, do you find that that creates a better experience when you're playing with, with your kids? If Definitely. it's cooperative? I definitely do. And, and just, just to help each other, you know, because there are mm-hmm. strategic uh, decisions you need to make with the game, which direction to move. It's hard to describe without without seeing it, but you're basically laying out cards and trying to get to an end, an end goal. So I, I think for a parent, though, there's a couple challenges there, and it's the same with the, the games that we've designed. How much do I get involved, right? If this kid, right. if my kid's making a bad decision and moving a direction he or she uh, shouldn't, do I jump in? Do I say something, or do I let them fail, right, and and potentially lose the game? At least as a parent, my instinct is to to you know jump in and say, oh, do you really want to do that? Don't you want to think about it? What if you went this direction and. You know, but it's good for me too to to say no, no. Let them make the decision. Empower them, right? And and if we lose, we can start over and play again. Yeah, yeah. I was actually I was listening to a podcast. It wasn't about family games, but but I was listening to a podcast the other day where someone was talking about how the one of the fundamental principles of a game is failure. That you have to have the possibility of failure. Do you do you find? That letting the kids make bad decisions and then fail at some aspect of the game. Do you find that valuable? Uh, a valuable aspect of gaming? Yeah, I do. Um, I think it's it's you know it, it gives them. Well, I, you know, I think the important part is to is for them to understand maybe why they failed, right, and be able mm-hmm. to correct that the next time around. It sounds like an obvious statement, but but super important, right, in in learning and being able to get a lesson from um from that experience so again you know not to focus on just one game just happens to be sitting in front of me here but uh race to the treasure does a good job of that whereas oh you turn left here what if you had gone straight down then you could have used this thing and done that and and allows them to start thinking of it more like a like a chess board and uh or a chess match and, and working through all the different permutations that way in a simpler way than than something like chess 
Um, so I think that's really good in, in as long as you can explain it to them after. Uh, our games are much different. Our games are more along the lines of, let's try to work this through. Let's try to figure out all the different possibilities. You know, did we did we look in enough places? Do we want to read that again? Did we pay attention to details? Because there is a lot of reading and being able to associate different clues that you find in the text to the actual physical puzzle that you're you're trying to solve. And again, it's the same. It's the same challenge. I have it with the games that we produce. Um, I, I imagine our customers have the same challenge, which is now I know my kid's going down a different a different road than he or she shouldn't. But this is a low stakes way to kind of to to learn those you know, mistakes and maybe correct them for the future. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, with a puzzle, you can't really. At least I would think with with a decent puzzle, you can never really fail it. You can just kind of stop trying to solve it. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Like, or yeah. the game you can have, you know, you you actually fail an objective and you got to start over. But a puzzle, it's just it's just a matter of persistence. Yeah, that's a great point. And actually, going back to you know the inspiration for what we do, one of the inspirations was these these video games. And I don't know, Mark, if you've dabbled in that. And again, I apologize for going into a different genre here, but no, that's fine. There was the King's Quest series. There was this other series called Secret of Monkey Island or something along those lines. I forget. Mm-hmm. I think it was the latter, the Monkey Island ones. You couldn't die. You, you couldn't lose. So the game just went on in perpetuity. And I, I don't think there was ever like a dead end or anything where you couldn't win either. Um, so the game was always open, to your point, right? It was always, you can do this. You just kind of, you may have hit a dead end, but you can still solve it. Um, in your mind, you've hit a dead end. The answer is still there. You just have to kind of work through it. Whereas the other one, it was... Yep. Hope you saved your game. You're you're gone. Now you have to go back to where you saved it from and start again. Um, I think both have. I never thought about this before. I think both of them have a different value set to them, right? I mean, one of them is I got to work through this. It's going to teach me persistence. It's going to teach me to not give up. And that's exactly what Clever Kids Mysteries is is striving to do. Uh, the other is oh. Nope, you made it. It's kind of the school of hard knocks. Nope, you made a mistake. That wasn't what you wanted to do. Go back and try something different, right? And um, I think both have a, have a different uh, message and, and value for learning. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I've I've written about this before a little bit, but I, I find the – I can't remember the word I used. The, the kind of the straightforward, objective nature of gaming to be very useful in that regard, right? Where it's – like games themselves, kind of an abstracted example of what happens in real life. But in real life, you know, you could fail at something and it could be a whole number of fuzzy, unknowable factors. But in a game, um, (laughs) at least, or at least a game where, well, in any game, even if there is randomness, right, you can typically go back and pinpoint precisely the point at which you failed or something caused you to fail. And being able to see that clarity, I think, is, is instructive to... Whereas, again, in real life, you know, if if you hit a point of, of failure for some kind of goal in real life, it can be much more fuzzy. But it is still guided by laws of cause and effect and semi-predictable outcomes. I, I think there's something there about games having the kind of abstracted clarity of causes and effect and consequences for your decisions and things you can work back towards that helps in everyday life and of understanding the more complicated nature of, of everyday life. Yeah, hundred percent. I think it's um, another great game and it's a classic game and I, I apologize for throwing out very obvious answers, but uh, the board no game, need sorry. To apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel I, I probably haven't played the more, you know, sophisticated uh, games that are out there. I'm still in the classics, but um, as far as board games, the game, sorry, which I think is a great game. Yeah, of course there's a lot of luck built into it and you've got to, you've got to pick the right cards and, you know, roll the right dice, so to speak, even though it's a card game. Uh, but also there's a lot of, okay, well I'm going to, you know, switch my, my uh, space on the board with someone else's, I'm going to make this decision. Um, So not only is there the mechanical part, but if I switch, you know, if I kind of mess up the game for, you know, the person next to me, 
um, is that going to come back around and, and, and get me in the future? <laughs> so there's a little bit of gamesmanship there too, which I think is really important. And to your point, right, definitely a, a correlation to, to how life plays out. Um, you know, do I want to upset this person next to me or is the other person re- about to win? So even though it's not as good of a strategic move for me, I stop the other person from winning. You know, I'm probably drawing a lot. Of, I'm probably really reaching here, but I, I do think there are some life lessons built into that. Oh, uh, sure, yeah. And to your point, I think the, the important part is to somehow deconstruct that or reverse engineer it after and say, you know, you came in second, but if you had just sw- swapped your spot with this other person's then, even though it didn't look like the right move, you would have actually ended up winning, you know? And yeah, I think that's what makes games really interesting, actually. And have you seen that, that kind of thing directly when, when playing games with your kids? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. And and, and again, I was terrible about um, letting them just go ahead and make a move that I didn't think, you know, was the right move. And I'm sure there's been cases where, uh, you know, their move actually <laughs> ended up being the right one, which is another reason to just not get in their way. Right. Let mm-hmm. let kids let let them do what they want to do. Uh, let them think through it. It's it's a safe place to make mistakes, to your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's 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 stakes within the the bubble of the game but you know the stakes are ultimately nothing uh which is which is a cool kind of magical nature of games right you can get you can get emotionally invested in something that doesn't have any stakes at all uh just for the the fun of it and the practice of it Um, have you found i was just gonna ask if you found some uh, examples of that in you know more mature games um whether they be cooperative or New tabletop games where you finish and it's like, oh gosh, I, I should have done this other thing. Oh yeah, all the time. Um, yeah. and I and I'm really interested in the kind of psychological blunders that we're pre-programmed to fall into, um, <laughs> which you know artifacts of you know how we evolved back from hunter gatherer days, perhaps. But but the idea of like loss aversion, where we we value losing things much more highly than we ought to relative to gaining things yeah the idea uh like the sunk cost fallacy i i I have to keep myself really focused on not falling into the sunk cost fallacy i don't remember the name of it but in, in card games in particular there's i call it results oriented thinking i think that's what magic the gathering players call it where when you're trying to construct a deck for that kind of card game uh, you have a tendency to try to insert little tech cards for like very specific circumstances, even if they're very unlikely. And yep. as soon as one of those situations happens, you think, yes, that was the right move to put that card in. But it was just that you happen to fall into that circumstance. It doesn't mean that on the whole, that card is increasing your chances of winning. Right? You use the results of a very small sample size in order to dictate uh, what the the proper kind of aggregate deck ought to be which is entirely wrong which actually happens in sports all the time it drives me nuts with sports announcers also where you know some weird situation happens and it's like oh yes or or like you know you know a coach goes forward on fourth down in in football and the the announcer's like well if they're successful he made the right call it's like no that's not how that works That's not how thinking You're works. not allowed to say that, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's either statistically the right call or it's not, no matter what the result is. Right, um, right. So there's all kinds of these little like psychological things uh, that I find very interesting that pop up all the time in heavier games. Well, pop up all the time in, all, in any game, really. Uh, yeah. Any game where you have decisions and you have odds and you have, yeah, decisions are the, the fundamental part of it. Yeah, I find that, you know, we're from Massachusetts because we, we do the sports analogies. Um, and I find that with basketball, too, where you see someone shoot a, a three-pointer from, you know, way outside of where anyone should be shooting. And it goes in. They're like, oh, I guess it wasn't a bad shot. So it's like, that was a terrible shot selection. It just happened. He got lucky. Um, or she got lucky. It's, you know, uh, I yeah, you see it all the time. Well, Basketball is really interesting because we're right in the middle of this like really massive strategic shift where the coaches are now taking points, expected points into account on different types of shots. So I remember seeing last year, maybe there was this because, you know, college sports tends to do these more extreme strategies before it reaches the pros. And there was a there was a college coach 
in the in, in basketball the idea is that like the mid range jumper is just the worst shot to take because it's <laughs> yeah. the hardest shot to do with the least amount of points. It's much better to take a couple step steps back and go for the three pointer. Right. And mm-hmm. there was a college basketball coach after some I think it was in March Madness last year, and someone asked them about, you know, you're gonna try to establish the mid range jumper and he's just like the mid range jumper is the least efficient shot. The most efficient shots are a layup at the hoop or a three pointer from the side. They give you blah, blah, blah expected points. The next most efficient shot is, uh, you know, any other three pointer. And so we see now these teams that are throwing up way more three pointers than usual, just because we figured out that the odds of making a three pointer versus the amount of points that that gives, gives you a higher expected points than on many of the two point shots. Yeah, and you see the announcers and the commentators lag even further behind the pro coaches in understanding how to think about that correctly. And I'm seeing it in football too with um, there's been a lot of analysis where it's on like fourth and one or fourth and two, it's almost always the correct move to go for it rather than punt. And I've, and I've noticed this season in the NFL, I've seen more teams, I think, go for it on fourth and one and fourth and two. Right. A lot of game theory and statistics now that data's taken over, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think it's awesome. I think it's I think it's absolutely fantastic. In some cases it makes the game, you know, so fundamentally different that you you know, perhaps audiences don't like it as much, but I don't know, maybe that just highlights a weakness in the rules of that game. Yeah. Like I've always thought there's and we're going off completely on a tangent now, but that's okay. We do this regular <laughs> listeners will know we do this all the time. Oh good. Uh <laughs> Don't worry about it. I've always thought that of the major sports, basketball was kind of as a game the the worst constructed game because of at least for viewing because of the way fouls can be utilized as part of the decision making of the game, which I guess incorporates more decision points. So maybe it's more interesting and strategic from the player coach level. But you know, it's it's watching someone shoot free throws is the least interesting thing to watch in basketball. Yeah. And it's funny. I, I, I don't have any stats or anything like that, but I, I was saying to someone the other day, um, you know, I'm from the Boston area, grew up a New England Patriots fan and it was it really worked out for me in the last, uh, you know, a couple decades here, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I get excited. I, I still get excited all week for the games. And then I sit down to watch them. And, and honestly, it's, I'll, I know I'm not going to sound like a real fan here, but they can be kind of boring. They're, they're, you know, short passes and, you know, just trying to do kind of your, your classic running plays. And, you know, they're very mechanical. They know statistically the right plays that are going to work. Uh, And then I flip the channel over to, you know, a team that's playing a more modern, I don't know if it's West coast style of football. And it's like, wow, they're, they're passing the ball back and then passing it again. And they're doing all these trick plays, which, yeah, I don't, I know they're not going to convert a whole lot um, or even if they do, but they're a lot more fun to watch. (laughs) <laughs> than my favorite right. team. Yeah. And I also, well, the, I, the thing with the Patriots is that all this, all the cool stuff they're doing is so subtle yeah, right. in terms yeah. of like <laughs> creating defensive mismatches and subtle movements on the line and stuff like that, that you, you, you have to really un- dig into the film to even start to appreciate what they're doing. Cause it, yeah, it just looks like, okay, they threw an eight yard pass. Right. But it was right. like a whole, like, you know, Belichick was, constructing that pass from the beginning of the game with how he was setting up the personnel and he knew he was, you know, there was going to be a linebacker on that guy. So, you know, on this play because of the way they've been substituting and doing movement and everything, but it's hard to see on TV. So from an entertainment level, if you had Belichick, you know, commentating over the game, even obviously it would have to be a replay. uh, I think the entertainment would go from a two to a nine or a 10, right? Because then you'd exactly what you just said. It would be like, wow, this is a genius, you know, trying to, uh, to strategize here. Yeah. And it's, I mean, just to kind of try to bring it back. That's one thing, if I could snap my fingers, I'd have in place today, which is to solve our games, you need to go to the, uh, the website and there's a, obviously a solve tab and you put in your answer and we tell you if you're right or wrong. The one thing I, you know, I haven't implemented is I'd love to know how many people get it wrong versus right. So we could kind of engineer around the, you know, are people struggling with the, you know, one puzzle 
in, in, in relation to the others? And should we do something there? You know, is that causing frustration? Uh, we wouldn't get that from the data, but we could go back and ask, you know, why are people stumbling on that one puzzle? And what does that mean for their enjoyment of the game? Is it is it kind of dragging everything else down because they may have enjoyed the other seven? So, yeah, I think anywhere in life, you know, I know data's taken over, but it could be really helpful too. And that's yeah. one thing that, you know, we've done the qualitative side. We reach out to each of our customers, ask them how they enjoyed the game. We get great, great feedback. We're very lucky. But the quantitative side, we have no idea how people are using the game and what's working and what's not, which for, I think, for a game designer makes it kind of tough, right? I mean, mm-hmm. if you're the Bill Belichick, you know which plays work, which ones don't. Uh, all those stats are, for the most part, in front of, in front of the team, and they've, they can, they can uh, churn through the data and, and figure stuff out. Yeah, that would be interesting. Uh, and, and it's something that's almost exclusively available to you as a puzzle game designer as opposed to, I mean, board games, you can have, you know, a large, be, I mean, to get that kind of data, you have to have a large set of play testers yeah. physically submitting the data to you. But once it's released, it's not as reliable. But if you have, yeah, it, it's something digital about the game that you can put a tracker on or or something like that on the back end and, and get information that could be very helpful. Have there been any surprises about what kinds of puzzles, at least on the feedback you've gotten, what kinds of puzzles maybe people prefer or have a more difficult time with than you anticipated or an easier time with than you anticipated? Yeah, so um, it's really funny you mentioned that because I think the most frustrating thing for myself is you, you know, you come up with a puzzle that you look at as kind of boring. The dinosaur one that I explained at the beginning is, is the simplest example. Mm-hmm. But I, to me, it was, okay, it's kind of interesting. It gets them in the spirit of the game or in the right mode, but it's kind of boring. It's kind of simple. Um, but I get you know feedback around, oh, we love that one you know, because it was a dinosaur and we could make that connection really quickly. Um, and then the ones that – and this is usually on the playtesting side – um, the, the puzzles that, you know, may have had a, a very hands-on approach, you had to do something, you know, sometimes we'll have the ciphers that yeah. you'll spin around to get to a certain answer and people will, you know, like those a lot. But there's other times we could try to come up with a hands-on puzzle and I, I just think it's the coolest thing. I'm like, if I was a kid, I would have loved this, this type of puzzle. And we get back, eh, it didn't really, you know, even my kids will say, yeah, that one was a little tough. That one was too confusing. And we have to go back to the drawing board and either can or, or just greatly revise something that didn't work. So I think that's probably, you know, what we get most for the first game we did, which was um, Mystery at the Lux Museum. Uh, of the eight puzzles, we probably got early feedback, very early feedback from play testers. And I'd say at first it felt like a disaster, right? As you're trying to process the data, which was, I'd say all eight of them had a different puzzle that they disliked where they liked the other seven. So at first I'm thinking, oh my gosh, all eight of them are broken, right? But then I thought (laughs) about it and I thought, well, gosh, we've only gotten one dissenting vote against each of the puzzles and the other seven were okay, we're probably all right. You know, some, some people are just going to, based on how they think, based on how they approached it, uh, for whatever reason, you, it's not going to, not every puzzle is going to work for every single player. Uh, so you just kind of have to hope that there's no egregious problems, you know, on, or, or I guess you I almost hope that there are egregious problems and we learn about them very early on so we can, we can fix them. But yeah. in terms of the types of puzzles, we have we have one in the Lux Museum where you actually create statues, and those statues come, you know, pre-built. These are all handmade games, pre-built with holes punched in them, for instance, or um, you know, different different physical layouts, and you have to shine a flashlight through them to get to the answer on a puzzle. Uh, and people just love that. You know, I've been asked all sorts of questions if I could license it and all these things because of the kind of resourcefulness where you're not just sitting there using a a cipher wheel or something along those lines. You're actually using physical objects to play the game. I wish we could create eight of those types of puzzles, but they're really, really hard to invent. So our our goal, uh, frankly, is for each game to have maybe two or three of those where there are cipher wheels, there's, you know, um, physical, you know, or there's paper statues, but statues where you're shining lights through them, something that gives gives our our uh, our players um something really hands-on and fun to do have you noticed that or ha- has it been your experience that uh different players different kids are diverse in, the, in what kinds of puzzles they not only enjoy but are able to solve easily yeah and that that probably gosh that's a great question 
I have identical twins, and even they have different puzzles that they're better at, uh, you know, from each other. So some of them like, you know, you know in, one, in this case, one of my daughters really likes the cipher puzzles and doing the um, decoding uh, a coded message. Um, she's more language oriented, you know. And the other one, it's our other game, but there was something where you had to get five different clues, put them together, do a little bit of math to get to an answer. And it's a little more analytical. It's it's basically, you know, how tall is a certain character in the game. And it's not easy to find out unless you, you kind of walk through all the different steps. Um, and she's very kind of more of an executive thinking in, in, in the way she approaches the puzzles. So for me, it's even like, oh my gosh, this is like an experiment. You got identical twins and they both tackle problems in different <laughs> in different ways. By no means am I actually do, running experiments against my twins here, but uh, I guess I am uh, by accident. And, <laughs> and, it's, it, and, and, you know, there's a lot of our friends that play the games and they'll come back and, and it's kind of like, yeah, based on the feedback, I could see that. You know, I know your your child well enough, or I could see where they would take to those puzzles, and maybe not the other ones. Yeah, yeah, I found in the most recent puzzle game I played, I found and, and realized that my wife and I have extremely different skill sets when it comes to puzzle games. <laughs> I was stuck on this one puzzle for I must have spent. 45 minutes just trying to figure out what the puzzle was because it, it, it was complex and it was one of those things which just it at first glance it just looks like complete gibberish and nonsense yeah. and so i was just trying to figure out okay what kind of puzzle is this so i can start working on a solution and it was one where i just gave up one night i'm like okay i'm going to bed and we'll try it again tomorrow well the next evening i'm, I'm sitting down to work on it and, and amber's there i'm like man you want to look at this in in do you have any idea what this is? And she solved it in 20 seconds. <laughs> and I was so mad and so relieved at the same time. Just a flurry of emotions, huh? And then the next puzzle was like a pure logic puzzle. It was like, okay, this is mine. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the, okay, other one, the one she solved had to do with, with uh, words. And it was it was like a language, part yeah. of it was a word scramble. And I'm so bad at those. <laughs> but when it's like a logic puzzle, like, you know, you've got a, a dog and a cat and a mouse on one side of the river and you got to send the boat across, you know, those kinds of like, where you just yep. have to sit there and deduce it. I, I can, I love doing those, but man, the, trying to dis, unscramble words is, is my bane, my, my downfall. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because there is the puzzle I mentioned earlier, which i um, not doing a good job describing it, but basically it's a picture of a stable with nine pens. And I give you, there's nine cards you get with each reindeer on it and a set of rules around where each reindeer can sleep. And, and the player has to figure out where the last one who's Rudolph uh, ends up. Oh, yeah, um, that's so my kind of puzzle right there. That's your kind of puzzle. And uh, you know, a lot of the adults <laughs> like that one too. It's, I, I almost, uh, to be honest with you, I kind of got lucky in constructing it in that it just worked out as it was the right type of difficulty, I, I got really lucky and just created these rules randomly in it. Like, oh gosh, if you just put them in a different order, it's really hard to, to do this. Not really hard, but it's hard to do this hard enough. And one of my daughters, um, no one really gets it the first time around because you read the rules and they're in a certain order and then all of a sudden it doesn't work and you have to start over again. Uh, and, and she put it to, and she was fine just kind of cycling through it and, and figuring it out, you know, and learning the other took to it, went through. And as, as soon as she hit that first kind of failure point where it wasn't going to work, got really upset by it and was like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe this isn't working. And, and I don't know if it was good or bad for her, but I, I said, well, let's just start again. Now you know more about where the Rangers have to go. And she kind of, she eventually got there, but it was just for a parent, it's really interesting to sit back and, and it, it honestly, it kind of helps you for the future saying, okay, now that, you know, when my kid comes home with homework, right, if it's a difficult algebra problem or something, I know that one of my kids is going to do a better job working through it and being more patient versus the other one's going to need a little more encouragement. So I never really thought about that until, until right now. Um, but it kind of sets you up as a parent to know your kid a little bit better when it comes to, to problem solving. Yeah, and that, that's so neat. That's so cool. I, I love that. Yeah, because I don't have any kids yet, but you know, we plan to have, have kids at some point in the future. And, and sure. I just can't wait to start playing games with these unknown future kids. But I think the experience of just seeing like, like how delightful is it to see them solve something? Is, is it just the greatest thing on earth? Yeah, it's, it is the greatest thing on earth. And, uh, you know, not even just 
our game, but um, we do Scratch, which is a, uh, a kid's programming language, kind of like a drag and drop thing, whether it's that or board games or, you know, um, their, their homework or whatever. It's the best best feeling in the world. So, you know, one of the things, the notes I had taken prior to our, our, our call here was, you know, we're trying to incentivize different things for different constituencies with the game with a kid it's got to be fun it's got to be engaging there's got all the stuff we've already talked about for a parent you know the fun part obviously matters you want to see your kid having fun but i think more important what we're trying to instill is okay i'm actually doing my kids a favor or I'm, i'm helping i'm supporting my kids education through this too i'm masking it right because there's a fun game and narrative and puzzles here but at the end of the day i'm 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 helping you know uh, helping them learn, helping them uh, become smarter kids and approach problems in a different way. Uh, none of those things are easy for us to to kind of build into a game, but that is the goal at the end of the day. But to your, answer your question, yeah, it's the best feeling on earth when you see them finally work through something. Yeah, and, and I feel like and this is just hypothesizing on, on my end. It's not something I've researched or, or studied or anything <laughs> or have any direct experience with uh, having no kids at the moment, but I feel like the kind of like problem solving in a logical way or in a creative way has got to be some of the most valuable educational things for kids above what a lot of schoolwork is. And I've read a little bit about this in regard to math, particularly where I know there's, there are a number of people who would argue and, you know, people who actually have knowledge on educational theory who would argue that in our country, we, we put way too much emphasis on rote memorization and math and not an, nearly enough emphasis on logical problem solving, because what an actual mathematician does is problem solving and right. all the basic stuff that we learned growing up doing workbooks in math like literally everyone's going to have a calculator in front of them in some way in the future. That's not really setting you up to the kind of things that you encounter when you grow up and have to do math. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I don't know if this tackles that head on, but if you, I think you'd be interested in this, Mark, if you, if you're want to see how that plays out in schools, um, if you're go to Twitter and just search for, you know, escape room, I forget what it is, like escape room in school or something like that, classroom escape room. I, I was astounded by seeing how many teachers are creating their own escape rooms, making this an interactive type of learning environment for kids. Oh, and that's awesome. It's so awesome, and it, it'll also make you, you know, a little bit upset that they didn't exist when you were in school. <laughs> we were in school. They definitely oh, didn't exist I when I was in I wish I had a better, like, like I was homeschooled, and and okay. you know, my parents did a great job, yep. but neither of them were neither of them were really math people. Like my dad, my dad studied computer science, but he was much more again on the problem solving end of it. But that's not what math textbooks do. Right. Um, my mom is good with she she did a, at the time a lot of book or actually still does a lot of bookkeeping you know basic accounting type stuff but again you know once you hit algebra and stuff that or, or like geometry that's not really her forte either so they just kind of relied on the math textbooks and it was all about this rote memorization and I learned to just not enjoy math and then now that I'm you know an adult I the mathematical stuff I do, I, I love because it's like figuring out how to create a function on Excel that does what I want it to do. And that kind of problem <laughs> solving is really cool. And yep. like at my old job, I created, I, w- I was a sales manager and I created based on my studies of in, uh, in my interest in baseball statistics, I made a metric for gauging sales in Excel and, and just mirrored a, base, a particular baseball statistic. And it's like, wow, I wish, wow. you know, my math growing up was this kind of interesting problem solving, figuring out how, how to do something rather than just trying to memorize equations. Yeah. And in your case, there's a creativity to it also. You were creating well, yeah, new, I mean, new and, models. And, and, yeah. and when I hear, um, you know, people who Actually, because I have friends who do programming and do mathematical stuff, and like the best parts of their job are the creative problem solving stuff. And it's like, yeah, we never have to like do 
Like no one's ever done in the 21st century has done long division on paper. Like you just have a calculator there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Changes the game a bit. I've, I have never <laughs> since school done any long division on paper. <laughs> Or cursive, if you want to switch uh, disciplines. Oh right? man, don't get me started on the on the pro <laughs> cursive people. <laughs> yeah, I don't, oh, know. I don't have a stance on it. I just know I haven't haven't done much other than signing my name, which you know, I don't even know if I need to do that anymore. With uh, well, no, doc- that's not even cursive anymore. <laughs> like for me, at least, it's just this kind of like semi coherent scribble, which seems to be the norm for yeah. for audit for signatures. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not the first one to do it, but uh, and I don't. To be honest, we don't go hard with the marketing on this, but the whole screen-free thing, for the most part, until the end, um, it does mean something. I, I do think, and this is just board games in general. Uh, I love just having the TV off, having your phone in another room, and um, whether it's with kids or not, right? And just just focusing on like a <laughs> something that's physical. I think. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping there's a renaissance there of some sort. I mean, phones are great. I'm on mine all the time. I'm, you know, it's my detriment, but uh, I think there's a lot of value in sitting there with something physical and thinking through something to your point, maybe having a pen and paper to help you out. I think that's, it's, it's fun. And uh, hopefully that's not going away completely. Oh, I think, I think the renaissance is happening. Oh, do you? That's good. I I mean, that's, you would know you're, at least I hope so with, with, with uh, me focusing on board games. I mean, it's certainly gotten popular. I hope it, I hope it continues. Well, that's another thing. There weren't board game, uh, what is it? Um, cafes and and things when I, at least that I knew of, not a lot of them growing up, whereas now they, I I see on social media, them popping up all the time. So Mm -hmm. I love what you're doing for the community, by the way. Thanks so much for, you know, um, just, just with board games and tabletop, it's, it's something I grew up with, something our family does, um, all the time. And I think it's important for, for all sorts of different reasons. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Mark. This was great. And, uh, learned a lot about what we were doing just from talking to you. Good. Um, good. I love when that too. happens. The, the, <laughs> the collaboration through discussion is the best thing. Nothing better than a good discussion. Maybe, well, maybe a good board game, but that's kind of the same thing. <laughs> Agreed. Um, thank you, John. Uh, so if people want to order your games, read more about them, uh, just go to cleverkidsmysteries.com. Is that That'll the work. best way? That's it. Fantastic. And they can get in touch with you if they want through there? Uh, they can. We're also on Facebook, uh, Twitter, typical. And you can probably just search for us and you'll find us. Great. Well, thanks again. And if you, particularly if you have a family out there and want an uh, escape room style or puzzle game style game for uh, you and your kids, again, go to cleverkidsmysteries.com. And don't forget to rate and review the podcast and check me out at thethoughtfulgamer.com uh, if you want my take in on other uh, puzzle games since I haven't played these yet. Uh, don't forget to uh, look me up on social media, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you would like to support The Thoughtful Gamer, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. One final thing I forgot to mention earlier is that we are doing a Q&A podcast soon, but we need questions. So if you have any questions for any of the people who regularly or semi-regularly appear on the podcast, we can probably pull them in if you... Uh, ask a question for them in particular so i've got a decent roster of people who have appeared on the podcast maybe even only a couple of times but i I maintain contact with them so maybe we can get a giant party for the q a podcast i don't know anyways go to the thoughtful gamer.com you'll see on the front page the link to submit questions for that thanks for listening everybody goodbye